This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Before I introduce my guest today, I have a request. And this helps me to get the best guest on the planet on this show. If you like this podcast, go to my iTunes page and write a review. Real simple. It takes a few minutes of your time. I will send you, for your time and toil, a free DVD of interesting information about the subjects in my world. Simply send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send that to you. My guest today is Phil Tetlock. He is a Canadian-American political science writer currently at the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania. Phil is right there at the intersection of psychology, political science, and organizational behavior. His book, Out Now, Super Forecasting, The Art and Science of Prediction. This is a book that you really have to read. Probabilistic thinking defined, exemplified. What a great piece of insight. Phil is also the co-principal investigator of the Good Judgment Project. What an interesting multi-year study on the art and science of prediction and forecasting. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Phil Tetlock. In preparing to talk to you today, I was thinking back to my days in grad school and specifically the fall of 1992, and even a little bit before that. And I was thinking to the political season at the time, and this was essentially the rise of Bill Clinton. And what's really interesting about the rise of Bill Clinton, and I think you probably have even more experience and more memory and probably were studying it more than me at the time, but I watched a lot of CNN and I thought it was so amazing as a political science major myself at the time in grad school, I was like, wow, all of the main players didn't run against then President Bush because his approval rating was so high. I mean, guys like Dick Gephardt, Bill Bradley, they were all like, we don't want anything to do with this. And so in that vacuum walked an unknown governor from Arkansas, who frankly was probably just trying to boost his political resume. And for that particular run, probably really had no thought of, you know, winning necessarily. But then a funny little thing happened. And what's really interesting about uh, forecasting and prediction, how in the world can... Could that have been predicted? That have been forecasted? Or could it have? Well, absolutely. It, it's so difficult to uh, reconstruct our past dates of ignorance. Uh, in the Super Forecasting book, we talk about that Saturday night a live episode in which um, the leading lights of the Democratic Party in 1991 bend over backwards uh, to avoid um, the, uh, the risk of being nominated to run against the invincible um, uh, President George Herbert Walker Bush. You know, you backfill time and you look back over time and it kind of looks like, well, this was all just expected to happen, but it could have unfolded in a completely different manner. But that kind of leads me into the to the kind of opening, opening you up to your expertise in this forecasting and, and prediction, which is, is something that most people just accept. We accept, okay, here's a prediction, here's a forecast, but there's usually not much follow-up, follow-through. We don't really ever check to see uh, what's happening. And there's all these experts that get paid all this money. But you, and I'm going to break this apart over the course of our time uh, today, but you have figured out through a lot of research and a lot of study, a lot of surveying, a lot of working with people, uh, that, that regular folks can beat the experts at their own game. Uh, essentially, that's that's right. I mean, the very best forecasters are talented people. I, I don't want to downplay their, their their credentials, but it is remarkable that the group of citizens we are able to recruit for the uh, forecasting tournament sponsored by the U.S. intelligence community were able to beat U.S. intelligence analysts at their own game. 
Talk about that, though. I mean, that's quite amazing. I mean, we're talking about often some of these large government programs. They have billions and billions in assets. I mean, the, uh, huge numbers of people. I mean, why don't you start from kind of the beginning of, of your process and how you were able to get to the point where regular people could compete with or defeat uh, people with unlimited funding? Well, this is a research project that never should have occurred if the most basic laws of bureaucracy had held. Bureaucracy 101 tells aspiring bureaucrats never never sponsor something that has the potential to be embarrassing and come back and bite you in the butt. They, the IR the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Activity, the Research and Development Branch of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, which presides over that $50 billion bureaucracy, IARPA, this, this upstart agency, um, had the temerity to, to do that. It, it, it was as if Goliath took David aside and said, here, here's some money, uh, try to develop a good slingshot. Was there a side of you that already knew that there was going to be some indication that your work was going to present results they might not like? It was a very formal competition. IARPA launched it in 2010. A lot of universities and consulting firms competed for the money. My wife and I, Barb Mellers, my collaborator, and I were still at Berkeley at the time. We put together a proposal that was a joint Berkeley-Penn proposal because we moved to the University of Pennsylvania at the end of 2010. But we, we were in competition with um, major research universities and consulting operations. For, for, for various reasons, the, the coalition of researchers we put together, which we called the Good Judgment Project, uh, was successful in recruiting very good forecasters, was successful in developing methods of training them, was develop, successful in developing methods of teaming them, was successful in developing algorithms that distilled wisdom from the crowd, and the net result was uh, the Good Judgment Project prevailed in the, in the competition. It, it, it won so decisively in the first two years that essentially IARPA terminated the other teams, let us poach the best talent, and put us in direct competition with a prediction market and internal benchmarks they had. Before this conversation, I was thinking, not knowing exactly, okay, you know, frankly, uh, as you mentioned, a bureaucracy funding you, and they might not like the results they get. But there's probably other people outside of the Defense Department who sponsor this. There's probably other people, I can imagine, in this world who have made their uh, their life's work, their life's blood, the money they make off predictions that are not checked, your work can't be a good feeling because I have a feeling in the long run, whatever that long run might be, your type of work is going to, is going to be something that's going to, it's going to cause a lot of people that are just used to saying whatever with no one checking them. That's going to go away in this, in, in some point in the future, I would think. I think it's going to be a long-term change. Culture change tends to happen very slowly, and we're, we're, we're talking about changing some very basic practices in the political world. I, I think we're going to see more and more uh, in um, advanced tech companies and advanced sectors of, 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 and the most sophisticated government agencies. We're going to see more and more quantification of uncertainty. Even It's going to extend beyond domains where we already do it with big data into domains that were previously thought to be the exclusive preserve of soft subjective human judgment. And soft subjective human judgment will increasingly be pressured to be more explicit and, and to demonstrate its value added. It's just not enough um, to say, you know, if you're a pundit, I, at, some, at some day I think you're right. I, I think at some point it, 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 will, it will be the case that pundits who, who talk about things being a distinct possibility or this could happen or might happen or may happen, uh, people will look at that and they'll say, you're, you're essentially saying nothing. I've liked a lot of his books, uh, The Lexus and the Olive Tree and whatnot, but you, you get on Tom Friedman pretty good. And I, I'm, look, there's plenty of you know, pundits that you could get on. I think people don't necessarily, and this also comes to the public too, is like we don't demand accuracy. We don't demand data as, as, as a whole, as a population, do we? And what is the reason for that, that we don't put the demand on these pundits for, uh, for accuracy? So incidentally, I, I, I have enjoyed Tom Friedman's books as well, and, and we didn't single out Tom Friedman because he thought he was a particularly egregious offender. I, I think he's very representative of the genre. Let me go to an example that, that I think a lot of people can, can relate to. So the Iraq war in 2003, the WMD issue. And I always, when people will talk about this, and usually it's a highly partisan thing, and I say what's really interesting about it to me is even if you don't remember all the details, if you had George Bush and Hillary Clinton on the same side of the fence, 
that at least tells me that behind the scenes, the intelligence agencies were delivering something that let two very partisan groups, Bush and Clinton, believe the same result. Why don't you talk about some of the lessons learned there and, and what was the real lesson there? Because clearly both sides of the fence, except for people like perhaps uh, Barack Obama and Bernie Sanders, both sides of the fence believe that those WMDs were there. And I would love for you to also to break apart some of the, the, the notion that that they should have been more probabilistic in their estimates for the public, but they were very certain they were there. And that was another issue you address in your work. Well, I think the Iraq WMD case is a very important one because I, I don't think the research project, the tournaments even would have happened had the intelligence community not made so massive an error on WMD. When this director of the Central Intelligence Agency tells the President of the United States and other principals that he thinks it's a slam dunk, uh, their weapons of mass destruction, or at least he thinks it's a slam dunk. He can convince people their weapons of mass destruction. Uh, whatever exactly he said, he said slam dunk. When, when, when the most senior officials in the intelligence community use terminology like that in a situation where uh, there is at least some degree of ambiguity, that's telling. Now, you're right. Uh, when you look back at the information available to key policymakers and intelligence agencies around the world, the preponderance of opinion was that Saddam was up to something, that he had some kind of, he was violating the UN sanctions. Uh, he, he was violating those and that he, nobody knew exactly what he had, obviously. Uh, there, were, there was no smoking gun, but there's a lot of circumstantial evidence. Saddam behaved in ways to encourage the impression that he had something, perhaps because he didn't want to appear to be weak. So Saddam was actually facilitating uh, the hardliners, uh, making it easier for the hardliners who ultimately destroyed him, um, which is a, another ironic subtext to all this. It's really hard to know what the true prob what, what probability would a perfect information processor have assigned to Saddam having weapons of mass destruction in Iraq before the invasion. We know it's not 1.0, but we also know it's not zero. We know it's somewhere in, in, in between. And we know that even the intelligence agencies of countries that did not want to invade Iraq thought that there was a good chance he had something. Now, I think if you were to construct some kind of weighted average of all the sophisticated observers and their perspectives on Iraqi WMD, you would find that the probability of Iraq having something, the estimated probability, given the information they had then, would have been higher than 50% and certainly less than 100%. So it's somewhere in between. Uh, let's say it was 70 or 75 percent. Uh, would the U.S. Congress have voted to approve the use of force if they had thought the probability was as low as 75 percent as opposed to a slam dunk? I think there's a good possibility they would not have. And I think the world history would have unfolded quite differently. Based on what you know, how is an, an error, because clearly it was an error to come out and say it's, it was a slam dunk, how did the experts get into a position to uh, tell me as much as you can or what you do know to, to make such a, a statement uh, instead of coming out with the, is that where the politics took over that instead of coming out with the probabilistic uh, estimate, they, they came out with the slam dunk. Is that what happened? Was that the, was that the partisan or the politics getting involved? I think it's very difficult to reconstruct. And I, I think Robert Jervis at Columbia university has written a, a, a very interesting postmortem of the, um, the the WMD intelligence analysis. Um, I think part of the problem was that this was happening in the aftermath of 9-11, and nobody wanted to make a false negative mistake. Mm. Nobody wanted to make the mistake of saying, Saddam has nothing, and then he turns out to have something. Within two years of having failed to um, warn adequately against uh, the risk of al-Qaeda's attacks uh, on 9-11, Two big false negative errors right in, in a row would be very politically damaging. If you're going to make an error in the blame game culture of Washington, D.C., make sure it's not the same type of error you made last time. Let me continue to break this apart with you. Your, your work is quite dense. I highly recommend people to take a look at super forecasting for sure. But let's say the talking heads out there, they're, the, the, in, in, I'm, I'm getting beyond even the, the, the intelligence issues in Iraq, but the talking heads out there, they're, off, they're smart people, they present themselves well, but they, they don't put these probabilistic weights on their predictions. And this could be a, a CNBC person talking in the market, this could be a geopolitical type person on Bloomberg. 
But even if they did, if you came out and you said, hey, uh, you know, I've got a chance of only being 60% right, well, that means that person could be 40% 40 wrong. If we start to get closer to this probabilistic way of thinking in public discourse, where does that leave us? I mean, we have to, as a society, dealing with uncertainty becomes a real, a real educational process, doesn't it? It sure does. That, that's absolutely right. So I'm going to go retreat into a little bit of academic talk for a second, and then go I'll, for I'll, it. Go for it. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try to make it as plain as I can. The accuracy of probability estimates of single events is inherently indeterminate, uh, as long as the forecaster is not so foolish as to say zero and the event happens, or 1.0, and the event does not happen. Otherwise, the forecaster can always argue that something unlikely happened when the forecaster appears to be on the wrong side of maybe. This means we're going to have to start thinking about about forecasting and judgment in, in, in a different sort of way. We're going to have to uh, think about it the way we think about sports. We have to, have to be at least as sophisticated about this as we are in thinking about, say, the batting averages of players in Major League Baseball or the free throw percentages of basketball players and so forth. It's a probabilistic game. You don't, you don't draw the inference that a forecaster is bad simply because the forecaster was on the wrong side of maybe on a particular call. It's really tempting to do that. We talk in the book about how one of the most sophisticated journalists in the United States, David Leonhardt, who created the upshot of the New York Times, how, how David Leonhardt, after the Supreme Court narrowly upheld Obamacare in 2011, uh, David Leonhardt wrote that the prediction markets had been predicting that there was a 75% probability the uh, Supreme Court would overturn the law. And he said, quite categorically, the prediction markets got it wrong. You know, those smart aleck economists aren't as, aren't as smart as they think they are. Markets aren't as perfect as they think they are. Now, as, as you, you've already alluded to, when the markets say a 75% chance, that means there's a 25% chance it's not going to happen. How much confidence should you lose in those prediction markets when you learn that they put a 75% chance on something that didn't happen? Should you throw them out altogether and say, oh, these guys are, these guys are clueless. I'm not going to pay attention to them anymore. Or should you say something along the following lines? Should you say, well, you know, these prediction markets have made hundreds of predictions on hundreds of topics over several years. And we know that on average, when they say 75% likelihood, things do happen about 75% of the time. So this market appears to be pretty well calibrated. Now, is it good news for the credibility of the market that they're on the wrong side of maybe on this call? No. Uh, you should lose a little bit of confidence in them. But how much should you lose? Let's say you thought there was a 90% chance market were really great beforehand, and now you learn that they're on the wrong side of maybe on the Supreme Court call. How much should you move downward from 90%? Maybe 88, 89? You certainly shouldn't go down to zero. Yeah, for sure. Let me add to where you're going there as well. And you bring up sports, and I can think of something like, okay, you start to look at the use of uh, probability statistics in sports. And the, the book and the film are quite famous now, Moneyball. I, I always end up watching it. I can't turn it off when it comes on. And I was a baseball guy. And I can look at Wall Street, too. And what's really interesting when I start to think about Wall Street is that so many on Wall Street, since they're playing a game that never stops, it really isn't about necessarily your winning percentage or your losing percentage. It's do you have a positive mathematical edge that you can bet on? And so that takes it even a step further than just looking at percent accuracy, because percent accuracy, uh, frankly, I mean, maybe it's great for the weather, but for serious parts of life, it really starts to open the question of of betting. And, and if you can find a, a positive mathematical expectation, doesn't it? For sure. I mean, it's very easy to convince people in finance that there's an advantage in being becoming more accurate, better calibrated, more granular in your assessments of uncertainty. We talked with Aaron Brown, the chief risk officer of AQR, a big hedge fund. Aaron also happens to be a really serious poker player. And he made the observation that you can tell the difference between a great a world-class poker player and a talented amateur because the world-class players are better at distinguishing 60-40 bets from 40-60 bets. I saw her mentioned in your book, but I've had Annie Duke on my podcast, and that was one of the most popular podcasts for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So good, good poker players know this. They, they, they know it in their bones that it, it helps to be granular. Maybe not. Maybe 60-40, 40-60 isn't good enough anymore. Maybe it has to be 55-45, 45-55. 
or 52, 48, 48, 52. But it pays to be granular. So in finance, it's a pretty easy sell because, you know, there are options and you can back out of options quite readily the probabilities, the implied probabilities that oil is going to go above or below some threshold price because you're buying an option to purchase things at a designated price. There, it's a pretty, it's an easier sell. It's a harder sell, I think, in national security to convince people that, let's say, you're the President of the United States and you, you're, the Social Olympics are on in, um, 2014, someone comes up to you and says, Mr. President, uh, our previous estimate of a Russian incursion into the Ukraine was uh, 1%. It's just spiked up to 20%. You want to do something, what do you want to do about it? Now, may- maybe the president would have done something about it, and history would have unfolded differently in various ways. But it, it, it's, it's telling that it's harder in many domains of life to translate improved probability into improved decisions. It's less obvious than it is in finance or in sports gambling and, and, and certain other quantitative um, areas. Yeah, I think when you have the motivation of making money, it's quite different than if you're a president and you have to make a call based on a, a probability estimate, and that call could affect potentially millions of lives, that's a completely different ball game than just uh, making the proper bet with a certain weighting, a certain probability weighting, trying to make money. Those are different ball games. Um, they're different ball games, but I don't know if they're completely different ball games. Uh, I think in, in both cases, you, the decision maker has to grapple with uncertainty, has to make implicit or explicit probability judgments that are going to influence his or her decisions. So there is a deep structural similarity there. I'm going to jump around on you because you're, you've covered a lot of territory in your work and I, it, it's fascinating to me. And I just, I love every, there's, there's so many, I could, I, I could, I could sit here and go line by line and literally pick apart the entire book and have you talk. But you bring up an interesting example with a gentleman named Robert Rubin who started, uh, he was, he was at Goldman Sachs. He was, he worked under Clinton, a great probabilistic thinker. And you know, everyone, everyone loved him. And thought he's a you know, fantastic job in the late 90s, right? And then, you know, the 2008 crash comes and he's the, the worst thing since it just he's just a terrible, terrible guy. I, I, I really don't have the, uh, the experience to speak to that one way or the other. But talk about the Rubin example and those extremes. And he was always just a probability guy. He was, and, and, and probability guys aren't always right, uh, just as the, the prediction markets weren't, weren't, weren't quote-unquote right about Obamacare. But they tend to be pretty well calibrated, which means that if you knew nothing else, you would, you would, you would be wise to listen quite carefully to what they have to say. Yeah. I want to, I want to try and dig a little bit into your super forecasters and some of the lessons learned and some of the, the ideas that maybe will translate or pass along to people listening or at least they'll get inspired to go take a look at your work. The 2008 crisis was really interesting because, you know, so many people, you can look at comments in 2005, 6, 7, even early 08, uh, you know, people are like, ah, oh, there's, there's no problem with real estate, you know, stock market's great, this and that. But, you know, a funny thing happened, uh, you know, that stock market, when the S&P started to tick down over the course of 2008, that seemed, that price action itself seemed to be a heuristic for for something. You don't necessarily know what's going to happen, but if you're, I guess where I'm going to let you go with is it when you start to train your super forecasters, and I'm just kind of outlining the S&P moving down over the course of 2008, but the super forecasters are looking for, one of the things they're looking for are sources of aggregated data and using those available sources of aggregated data. If that's betting on sports, that's looking at Las Vegas odds you know, going to the uh, to the various sports books, but I'm thinking aggregated data is also uh, the price action in markets. Why don't you talk about aggregated data as as one aspect of uh, the 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 traits and trainings that go into the super forecasting? Uh, that's right. The super forecasters are acutely aware that there is very valuable information lying around in the world. Uh, that's been pre-processed for them. So they don't have to reinvent the wheel when they approach many problems. Uh, now, the stock market is far from a reliable indicator to whether there's going to be a major economic recession. Paul Samuelson famously joked that it's predicted nine of the last five recessions. But that doesn't mean the stock market is a zero predictor. Uh, the stock market uh, has some predictive power there. Super forecasters are acutely aware of the wisdom of the crowd literature. They're also aware of the potential madness of the crowd. 
they approached these things somewhat warily, but if they knew nothing else but a good wisdom of the crowd indicator as reflected in London bookie odds or the latest prediction market results, if they knew nothing else but that, they would probably want that to be their starting prediction. You know, as we as we dig apart this, I want to read just a brief excerpt from your work. And it said, researchers have found that merely asking people to assume their initial judgment is wrong, to seriously consider why that might be, and then make another judgment produces a second estimate, which, when combined with the first, improves accuracy almost as much as getting a second estimate from another person. So it's almost like getting a second opinion from yourself, but the combination of the two makes you more accurate. It it just isn't intuitive, is it? It's not very intuitive, but I, I think it is intuitive to people that we talk to ourselves. We're talking to ourselves all the time. So we, we know that there are, are, are quite often conflicting opinions in our own heads. Not, not as strange as it sounds to ask somebody to offer two, two separate estimates. Yeah, and I, you know, another aspect that you talk about in your work, and I believe this starts with Daniel Kahneman, I know you're quite fond of. Educate the audience, just for people that have never heard of this topic, educate them to the idea of the the inside-outside distinction and how that plays into uh, the super forecasting technique and training. That's one of the bigger advantages that super forecasters had over regular forecasters. It was their tendency to start with the outside view and work into the inside slowly rather than what regular forecasters would do, would start with the inside view and rarely consider the outside view. In, in the forecasting tournament, our, our, our forecasters were asked an, an extraordinarily diverse range of questions. They were asked about Sino-Japanese clashes in the East China Sea. They were asked about Russia and the Ukraine, Greece leaving the Eurozone, Ebola, Arctic sea ice, all over the place. So no, ex- no, no forecaster, super or regular, is going to be an expert, quote unquote, on, on anything more than a very tiny fraction of the questions posed because they're so heterogeneous. This is putting a premium on mental agility and being a quick study. Let, let's say for sake of argument, you're in the tournament and someone asks you a question about whether a particular African dictator is likely to remain in power for another year. And you can barely spot the country on a map let still say anything intelligent about who the dictator is. So you know almost nothing as your starting position for the forecasting problem. If you're a super forecaster, even though you know almost nothing, you don't know nothing. You know something. They're able to extract information very quickly. And there is a kernel to that question. And, and it is, the dictators tend to be sticky. Once a dictator has been, is in, has been in power for a certain period, the likelihood of that di- dictator making it another year is extremely high. It's probably as high as 0.95. That doesn't mean you're going to say, oh, there's a 0.95 likelihood of this particular dictator remaining in power. It, but it does mean that your initial estimate is going to be that there's a high probability of dictator survival. And you're going to adjust from that in response to new evidence about the particulars, the inside view of, the, of that situation. So if you discover on the inside view that this is, dictator is 91 years old and has advanced prostate cancer, you're going to say, hmm, I'm going to down, down, downplay it. And if you discover there's uh, intense fighting in the suburbs of the capital between rival military units, again, you're going to adjust. But you're going to, you're going to start with a reasonable base rate judgment, and then you're going to adjust uh, in response to the particulars. Most people just jump into the particulars right away, and that, that can cause some, uh, that, that is not a good idea if you want to get a really good Breyer score, which is the accuracy measure we used. I think that raises an issue here where so many of us get fixated on the why, but it's more about the how. I mean, the super forecasters are more about the how. This is, it's, this is very, very data driven, and it's 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 breaking things up into their pieces. And, and uh, talk about the issue where so many of us get fixated on the why and and how that's to our detriment when it comes to any type of forecasting or prediction. Well, that, that's right, and it's really interesting that there seem to have been more software engineers who are super forecasters than political scientists. Hmm. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, these are guys that are used to, you know, bits and bytes, zero, one, let's code it, let's test it out, let's see what's going on. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, I'm, I guess I mentioned a political science degree in myself. I mean, I've, uh, hopefully I, I can, <laughs> I've learned to, to, to put all those opinions aside to some degree and look more at the data. But yeah, it's, 
I think most of the most of humanity probably sides more with the feeling that we're we're all political science uh, majors and we've all got an opinion, but it doesn't work out that way, does it? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. But the, this distinction between how and why thinking is 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 a, is a very important one. We, we talk about how uh, super forecasters are less likely, uh, for example, to believe in fate than uh, regular forecasters or most citizens are. What does that mean? Well, there's an interesting body of psychological work that suggests that when you remind people of all the fluky circumstances that led them to make an important decision in their lives, how they came to be married to a particular person or wind up living in a particular city or doing a particular job, when you, when you highlight all of the uh, no probability uh, events surrounding those outcomes, the net effect of doing that for most people is to persuade people that the event in question had to be, that it was meant to be. That's even true for lottery winners, for example. When they win, they don't think it was just a fluke. They often infuse it with some deeper metaphysical significance that it was somehow meant to be. Super forecasters don't think that way. They think, well, things happen. Uh, someone had to win. Uh, something very improbable just happened. Improbable things do sometimes happen. It would be very unlikely if unlikely things never happened. It would violate the laws of probability. Uh, so super forecasters are that way. It, it's a rather unromantic worldview. It means that it, the super forecaster might have to look at his or her spouse and say, well, you know, I guess I could have wound up with any one of, one of 433,000 other spouses, uh, but we wound up together and let's make the best of it. Well, and that's what's interesting about your work is that you're not attempting to tell people, hey, this is about meaning or this is about happiness. You're saying, here's what happened. Here's the data. Here's how uh, regular people can can start to forecast and predict social phenomena with with greater accuracy than you might expect and greater accuracy than perhaps extremely well-paid uh, experts. But again, it, you're... You're not attempting to tell people some, you know, this is the way the world is and you should feel this way and feel that way. You're just kind of saying, here's the data, take it or leave it. Am I reading you right? That's exactly right. These are, these are the data. If you, if you want to enjoy the benefits of thinking more probabilistically, the book lays out how you can go about doing that. Uh, if you prefer to think in terms of fate, then you may have less use for your, a book of this sort. Now that we're not going to go there today because that's a whole different subject area, and I can think of a lot of a lot of people out there that would probably really I, look. I've seen the people that, that that love your love your book, but I can think of some people out there, guys like Richard Dawkins and uh, Dan Dennett. I mean, there's a lot of people that would probably relate to this. Let me go on a sidetrack for a second. You're 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 good enough in your work to to go ahead and and outline some. These are people that you respect that you've worked with, where that they might have some criticism of the notion of super forecasting. And I would love for you to kind of outline just briefly if if Daniel Kahneman is considered a slight critic or Nassim Taleb is considered a slight critic, even like even though, like I said, you've worked closely with both men. I know you respect them both. Talk about their criticisms of the idea of super forecasting. Well, I think these are matters of degree more than matters of kind. I think Nassim Taleb puts more emphasis on the radical unpredictability of high impact events, uh, like black, the so-called black swans. I, I, I think we agree that, uh, extremely high impact, low probability events can have a huge impact on history, that this is manifestly true. We prefer to think of there being a continuum from white swans to gray swans to dark gray swans to black swans. We think it's useful to ask how good can early warning and early opportunity indicators be for swans of varying degrees of grayness. It's not a dichotomy between white and black swans. So I think we see greater value in investing energy in improving the accuracy of probability judgments, whereas I think Nassim Taleb in his most recent book on anti-fragility sees greater value in investing in contingency plans to cope with black swans. I, I just a, a different, different, different emphases. I don't see how you can make contingency plans without also attaching probabilities to scenarios. Uh, so I don't think there's any avoiding probabilities. I think you can try to cover them up, but but I, I don't think it's I don't think it's wise to try to do that. So we, there is a difference of opinion there. I think the differences with Danny are are, are even slighter. 
they uh, have to do with uh, the degree to which he is less optimistic than we are about the feasibility of finding better forecasters who will be consistently better, of training them to be consistently better, of teaming them, of finding algorithms that prove to be consistently better. So I, I, I don't think he's, he denies that there's some p- potential for improvement. I think he's probably a little more pessimistic than we are about the magnitude of the potential, but it, these are subtle differences, and I think each of us is willing to move in response to evidence. I think we're, you're, we are inevitably going to run into low predictability years in which the very best forecasters uh, are hard hard-pressed to do any better than dart doing chimpanzees. Talk about the words prediction and forecasting, because I think people really do, from a very, you know, big picture, look down 35,000 feet flying, uh, you know, prediction is, this isn't certainty. This Forecasting is not certainty. This is, this is, this, this, and this is getting back to the whole theme of this conversation, is, is really staying in or getting into, for the first time, a probabilistic mindset. It is hard. Imagine you're talking to a super forecaster in a bar and a conversation turns to global warming and someone turns to the super forecaster and says, hey, do you believe in global warming? I think your typical super forecaster would look that, look at that as a stupid question. Just, mm-hmm. just pretty stupid. Why is it a stupid question? Well, there are two major reasons it's a stupid question. First, uh, global warming is ill-defined. What in goodness name does it mean? Does it mean, does he expect the temperature of the earth to be 3.6 degrees centigrade warmer in 2100 than it was, say, in the average of the 20th century? Or the 20, I mean, what, what exactly is the threshold for global warming? Is it 2 degrees centigrade, 1 degree? What are, what are the bands? That would be the first, super forecasters don't like vague verbiage, and they don't like vague verbiage when it comes to the outcomes of forecast. They also don't like vague verbiage when it comes to uh, things like this, you know, using distinct possibility as opposed to numbers. And they don't like saying, do you believe, as though your beliefs are something like a light switch that can go off and on, zero or one, because they distinguish many degrees of uncertainty. So the right way to ask the question for a super forecaster would be, to what degree do you believe that the temperature, the average surface temperature of the Earth in 2100 will be some, in, it will fall into the following temperature band differentials? Yeah, and that's not sexy. They don't, that's not exactly casual barroom conversation. <laughs> it's not exactly that's, the thing that, that, you get, that even political ideologues can, can get all heated up about. It becomes a pretty technical matter of let's sit down at the table here and try to calculate and go through the time series and go through the causal models and go through the climate models and look, look, look at how accurate they have been, look at what the critiques are, and um, reach a reason judgment about how, 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 what, 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 the, what the likelihoods are. Uh, now, you're not going to mobilize political, the political will you need to do something about climate change if people are saying, well, you know, I think the probability based on the 2015 temperature spike has moved from 0.86 to 0.88 of the temperature in 2100 being 1.3 degrees centigrade or higher. <laughs> you see what I'm saying. It's, uh, yeah. People's eyes start to glaze over. All the fun of of politics seems to be drained out. You know, all the opportunities to denounce the other side for being stupid or gullible or rigid or, you know, (laughs) all all, all the the fun stuff in political psychology. You know, the math can start to get a little more advanced, but uh, the process uh, in in simple form is, and I'm I'm kind of quoting here, uh, try, fail, analyze, adjust, try again. I mean, this is kind of how we all learn as kids. But something happens to us. Maybe when we become adults, we for, we forget this whole uh, this whole skepticism and uh, trying to trying to have some scientific principles to our lives. Right, and that, and that's because a lot of these questions, when say, do you believe in climate change or do you do you support X or Y or Z? Uh, they're not really asking you for a considered probabilistic judgment about the consequences of going down one policy path or another. They're asking you, what what political tribe do you belong to? Mm. Yep, are you yep. are you one of us? Or are you one of them? Yep, yep, for sure. And that's a game that super forecasters tend not to play. And it is interesting that uh, you know if I, if the super forecasters when I look at their backgrounds, they're quite heterogeneous. I mean, they're uh, they're, they're 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 diverse, but but there are there is overrepresentation of among people who are accustomed to thinking about very complex problems in ways that decompose them into tractable components. Like software people, finance uh, analysts, financial analysts, and some and some political risk analysts as well. 
Let me ask one last question since I've got you here. I think Daniel Kahneman asked you this question, I believe, if I if I'm remembering right. But do you see the super forecasters as different kinds of people or as people who do different kinds of things, which is ultimately this nature versus nurture question? Danny Kahneman has a wonderful way of posing succinct and uh, incisive questions. That that is one of the key questions. It's both. It's not true that everybody, anyone, could be a super forecaster. There are certain cognitive and motivational prerequisites for becoming a super forecaster. A surprising number of people could improve their probability estimation skills quite a bit if they followed the guidelines in the book. So there is a lot of room for improvement for a lot of people. Certainly, many people who are not currently super forecasters could become super forecasters if they were so inclined. Here's, here's the core of it. I'm, I'm sometimes asked, how, how could these amateurs have beat, beaten intelligence analysts? I don't think it's because the amateurs were more intelligent than intelligence analysts, and I certainly don't think it's because they had more political knowledge than the intelligence analysts. I think it's because the super forecasters believe that probability estimation of messy real-world events is a skill that can be cultivated and is worth cultivating, and they, they took a shot at it. They invested effort. It doesn't matter how high your IQ is or how much political knowledge you have or how exalted a status you have as a political pundit. If, you, if you're not going to take seriously the challenges of probability estimation, you're never going to get better at it. You don't learn to distinguish 60-40 bets from 40-60 bets by using vague verbiage forecasting like I think there's a distinct possibility of X. The only way you learn is by making your judgments explicit, getting feedback, and learning. Did you ever think 30 years ago that you'd be on such the front line of an interesting kind of like, real, I mean, look, probabilistic thinking is not necessarily new, but you are right there at the front line of getting people to, to look at it in a different way with some really great examples. It's quite fun, huh? It, 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 it's fun. I mean, I started the work when before Gorbachev became general secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, and you know the experts then were had you know weren't able to predict that, but everybody could explain it after the fact. Uh, it doesn't seem to matter how high the stakes are. The, the thinking is equally equally sloppy and tendentious and self-serving. So I, I see this as an important part of human progress, of moving the Enlightenment agenda forward. It, it, I think political debate, we, we, can, we conduct political debates remarkably primitively. I think when people look back on how primitively we conduct, conducted political debates 400 years from now, they won't judge us any more charitably than we judge the people who ran the Salem witch trials. Mm. I think that's a great place to end it. I think that uh, gets people thinking. Uh, the book... The book is Super Forecasting the Art and Science of Prediction. It is everywhere. Is there a website we can send people to, Phil? I think people might enjoy, if they um, or if I find the concepts interesting, they might enjoy visiting superforecasting.com, which is a blog that's run by some super forecasters. I also am now on Twitter, believe it or not. I've never done that before, and I'm enjoying it. So I would welcome people to track what's going on there. Thank you for taking the time today, sir. I appreciate it. Okay, take care. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.